Hello and welcome to the RPG Blender, where we give lesser played games and forgotten settings the roll the dice they deserve. I'm your host, Game Master George, and today we are going to be continuing our look into the playtest release of Rupture. Previously, we took a look at the overall lore of the world, as well as a guide to character creation, the basic mechanics, and the mechanics of magic. So today, we'll be talking about how you, the narrator, can bring it all together. We'll go through adventure creation, random encounters, and the unique threat level mechanic. Then we'll cover some house rules that I'll use when running this game again. Now, there are two things that I want to mention here. First, this is a playtest release, so things may have changed by the time of the final product. So be sure to follow for an update video when the final release occurs. But second, this video is much more subjective than the previous ones. This comes from my experience running the game rather than pure mechanics. As such, take everything that I talk about here as a recommendation rather than a hard and fast rule for this game. But now before we dive in, a quick word from our sponsor, Rupture. Journey into the land of Taral, a world World where magic exists in everything, where people learn to channel their natural magics or are destroyed by them, where science harnesses elemental forces to create new techno-magic wonders, where the world has never seemed so small, yet so full of mystery. With its character background generator, creating a character is quick and easy, giving you a full background of hooks and stories to add to this world. With 17 unique species and 12 classes to choose from, plus further customization through unrestricted skill access, you're free to build any kind of character you like, or leave it to chance. Join the adventure by signing up for their mailing list at www.rupturerpg.com and back their Kickstarter coming September 6th. Now without further promotion, let's dive into a brand new RPG in part 5 of Let's Run Beta, Rupture Narrator Tips. When it comes to running any game, the first thing that you need to know is where it's set. We've been covering a lot of the locations on this channel through our lore shots. This is a world built around secrets, around mysteries. The entire basis of this game is the mystery of what happened in the rupture. This massive event when magic came pouring out into the world, granting magical abilities to every creature and infusing the world as a whole with mana. The reasons behind this are unknown in the current day. And that's not the only secret. Where where did the Shunok come from? Why are the ruins of Citizel aging backwards? And what caused the creation of the Stoneborn? Scattered throughout this world are pockets of mystery that you can use in order to create your adventure. Adding to that, as the harnessing of magic has occurred, the world has become smaller. Not physically, of course, but through travel. There are now faster ways of travel than you'll find in most fantasy games. And even with traditional overland travel, it doesn't take that long, comparatively speaking, to travel from one side of Taral to the other. This gives you the chance to highlight locations with many completely different atmospheres in the same adventure. As while travel isn't necessarily easy, it is still more readily available than you would find in most other games. Rupture is perfect for my three location system when it comes to adventure generation. The way that I approach adventure generation is with three distinct story beats. There is the hook, the twist, and the climax. Now before I get more in depth about these specific moments, these are just names. Just because I call step two the twist doesn't mean that you need some kind of betrayal or massive upheaval of the story every time you reach the second act. It is just meant to represent a specific story beat. So let's talk more about these three specific moments. The hook is the moment where you're going to reel in your adventurers. This is when you dangle out that quest line and try to rope them into the story that you're about to tell. Nothing too complicated here, it is the moment when you are beginning the adventure. From there we go to act two, the twist. This is the second major beat of the adventure, where the party has begun their adventure and then reach another point of large information. This could be, as indicated by the name, a moment where they learn the truth behind whatever their adventure is. Or it could be where they reach a primary goal and are then led toward the conclusion. You can have multiple beats like this in a story, like for a larger adventure where you're going to be collecting multiple pieces before finally heading to the end game. But in general, for an adventure in this system, having just the three locations is a good fit. And the final moment is the climax. This is the big moment that you've been setting this adventure up for. The final confrontation with the bad guy, or resolution of whatever the overarching problem of your adventure was. None of this is terribly difficult to grasp. This is Adventure Building 101. 
But with how the world of Rupture is built, it gives you a unique opportunity to have each of these moments in a separate location. The party will start in one place, get their hook, travel to their second destination, whether it's something that they mean to go to or are going to be led to through investigation. And along the way, they'll find other bits of story, be it personal or random encounters. Then once they reach that second location, they'll do whatever quest bits they need before heading off to the final location. Their random encounters, their story beats, and anything else that you choose to add in along the way. These three locations are the story of the quest, but the bits between these locations are where your characters' stories come in. These are the moments where you can bring in people from their past, or use their beliefs to have small side quests come in to divert them from their path. A lot of game masters struggle with this, struggle with making travel something that's impactful, and this is the way to do it. You don't necessarily include your player's story in that main quest, you use that main quest as a way to introduce the character's story along the way. So just to demonstrate how easy Rupture makes it to be able to build out a quick adventure like this, I'm going to use this three-act structure and a random place generator in order to grab three locations from the world of Toral, and then I'm going to quickly here improvise a three-act story using those three locations. So we're going to quickly come over here, we're going to generate three random locations, and we're going to use them to tell a story. Ah, so let's run this program, and we get ooh, our hook is Vegan Helm, frozen island in the north, populated largely by pirates. We then go to the twist of High Keep. High Keep is also on Vegan Helm. So that's actually very coincidental. Highkeep is the dwarven home under the mountains of Veganhelm. And then that sends us to a climax in Sakala, another island, strangely, but this time on the south side of Toral, populated by the lizard-like Siskra. So the hook is an easy one here. Our adventurers are traveling on a merchant ship destined for High Keep. They're traveling from, let's say, Luzia and up to High Keep. They might be part of this merchant's crew, or they might just be hitching a ride as they're traveling there for some unrelated business. But along the way, as they're traveling past Veganhelm, along the coast of Tain, they're beset by pirates from a tribe in Veganhelm. The pirates board the ship. However, unlike in most pirate raids, they don't appear to be just grabbing up random valuables. No, they seem to be looking for something specific. Some bit of cargo that this merchant is carrying to High Keep has called these pirates here. What is it that this merchant is trying to deliver to High Keep? Why do the pirates want it so badly? Or who's hired them? From there, if the players manage to fight off the pirates, then they'll be able to continue their journey to High Keep. If not, then they may be taken prisoner by these pirates, brought back to their tribe on Veganhelm, where the players will need to find a way to escape and possibly gather back that stolen treasure and continue their road to High Keep. Now, upon reaching High Keep, the merchant or the players, if the merchant was slain, will go to deliver this cargo to their contact. It'll be identified as some kind of large, precious jewel, unknown significance, but with some kind of magical energy within it. It was brought here to be sold to a Siskra merchant who's bringing it back to Sakala, where their jewelers will be able to take this stone and craft it into some wonderful marvel. Here the players will be brought into the fold and asked to accompany this jewel in case of further pirate encounters along the way. They'll then begin their travels down to the archipelago of Sakala. They will go to deliver this jewel to whomever the contact is. However, upon arriving, they will find that this contact is missing, their house in shambles, something has gone horribly wrong, and it is then that the people who hired the vegan helm pirates will strike, attempting to claim the gem for themselves. Perhaps the gem is the heart of an ancient dead god, an occult descended from those who once worshipped this deity are seeking to rebirth their god. Or perhaps this gem was stolen from the ruins of Citizel, and a Shunok team has come to reclaim it and bring it back to the island home. Or perhaps pure greed motivates the Empire to come and claim this gem and whatever unknown magical powers it might possess. And just like that, on the spot I've created an adventure with three random locations. The hooks in the book are enough to give you the inspiration that you need in order to create this kind of adventure. Simply pick three random locations and use a little bit of the story for each of them in order to build this adventure. From Vegan Helm, we took the pirates. From High Keep, we 
took their reputation as merchants, and from Sakala, the world-renowned jewelry crafting of the Saskra. Use this method and you'll be able to easily create adventures for your own group with this system. So now that we talked about adventure creation here, let's talk about how they handle the between moments. I talked about how you can use random encounters and character story beats in between the major set pieces of your adventure. One of the things that Rupture does very well is their random generation, and their random encounters are no exception. When your characters are traveling across the land of Toral, they will make a luck check, which represents the chance of a random encounter. The difficulty of this check changes depending on the terrain that they're going through. Traveling through a tundra, they're less likely to have a random encounter than if they are traveling through a dead land. Now, if the group fails, you will roll for a random creature from the traveled terrain. For example, if you're traveling through the forest terrain and fail the luck check, you will roll a d12. Getting a 12 on that roll will result in bush bandits appearing. This brings us to another unique feature of this game, the bestiary cards. Each creature in this table is represented by a card. This card has a number of features which help you to run this encounter. For example, the bush bandits. Up at the top, you will see the character's name as well as an indication that this is a special creature. More on that later. This is the number that you would need to roll on that random encounter table. So by rolling a 12, this is the encounter we got. Just below the art filler star, you'll see strength based. This indicates that this creature is generally fighting using strength tactics rather than agility. Though, I have to say, from the description of this creature, it might seem more like agility. But hey, that's what playtests are for. Then right next to that, you will see the word passive. This is the creature's temperament, as in its mood when it's encountered. A bush bandit, for example, is passive. This means that it will be generally friendly, but may avoid the party. It will probably choose to flee if attacked, but it may attack if there are no other options available. Other temperaments range from friendly to territorial to pure aggressive. In this case, given this creature's nature, it will attempt to hide when the party comes near. Then if it spots some shiny that it might be able to snatch quickly, it will attempt to do so and then flee into the forest. You get all this from the description below. This contains a brief description of the beast, as well as a bit of advice on how to play them. Also within this block, you will see their special ability. This is a cool, unique power that this creature has and will attempt to use if forced into a combat or otherwise useful situation. Finally, at the bottom of the card, you will see what the players care about, the loot. The Bush Bandit, when defeated, will reward with tiny nature cores, as well as random shiny objects. Now, one thing that you will note is missing from this is any kind of statistic. That's because these bestiary cards do not indicate the strength of a creature. Instead, you have a threat level, which you will assign to this creature. The threat level is where you will get things like their life points, their attack rating, and the dice for their special ability. For your creature, you will choose a threat level ranging from light to deadly. In doing so, you can take any creature in the book and scale it to the level of your party. Just starting out, throw light encounters at them. Doesn't matter if it's an undead abomination. Give it the light threat level, and it will be something that is well matched for your party, albeit having the flavor of that large, massive creature. Now, if we remember, the Bush Bandit had the word special next to its name. That means it uses the special stat block. These are unique creatures which always have this specific stat block. Now, as far as building adventure, that's about as far as I can take you. From here, you just need to dive in and start getting creative and telling your story. But there are still a few things that I can help you with, and these come in the form of my own house rules. This is a great game, but almost every game can benefit from tweaks that help accommodate your specific table. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through this game in the order of the previous tutorial videos. For each of these videos, I'm going to give one house rule that I would use when running this game again. So if you have not checked out those earlier videos, make sure you do so, otherwise this section's not going to make much sense to you. Let's start with an easy one, the setting. If you've been watching the previous videos, then you've seen me create some small adjustments for each segment which accommodate a very different setting. These small changes can create a very different world, and there's no reason that you can't do the same. This is a game with a built-in setting, yes, but more than anything, it is a framework of rules that are easily able to accommodate any kind of setting that you would like. This makes it very easy for applying these rules to whatever setting you would like. Moving on from the setting, we have character creation. I love randomization. I love the kinds of characters that you can get when you let go of your preset ideas and just let the dice decide what you're gonna be. But when you're running a group, 
you need some internal balance. If you have one person that's on the very low scale of everything and one that's on the high, you as a narrator are going to have a very hard time. As such, I recommend allowing your players to use as much or as little randomness as they choose. At any point during creation, when they are forced to roll for a random number, let them take the average. So when they're getting their skill points, they would be rolling 2d6. You can give them the option of rolling or allow them to just take the average of six. It's the safe bet for them. They're not going to get gimped, but they also won't get the bonus skill points of the higher ranks. Offer this as an option for your players. And if you have a player that rolls two skill points, consider letting them take it afterwards. Likewise, the personal history is one of the best moments of character creation. However, they might roll a one on their d12 and only get one card. So since they would be rolling a d12, dividing by two rounding up, let them choose to take three cards as the average roll. This is a personal thing for me and doesn't really play into this averages idea, but I love the personal history cards. And when I were to do this again, I would absolutely let my players roll and have that be the minimum number of cards they choose. If they want to, they can always keep picking until that maximum of six. Next up is the basic rules. Leveling up is simple in this game, but what's not as simple is multi-classing. In truth, multi-classing really doesn't get you much until you've taken three levels in that class. See, in order to take your first level of a class, you need to already have the class skills at three. Meanwhile, you're not going to get starting equipment for getting that, and you don't start getting special abilities until you've reached level three in that class. But I think that you can actually add more weight to multi-classing, and I believe you can do this through attribute changing. So when you take a second class, you can choose to take one of the class attributes from your first class and one of the class attributes from your second class and make those your new class attributes. So if you become an assassin barbarian, you could choose two from agility, intelligence, strength, and constitution to be your new class attributes. This gives you at least some benefit for the slowing of your gaining of class abilities. For magic, we're going to continue with something that I mentioned during that previous video, and that is with mana channeling. I mentioned in that video that you should always have mana channeling happen have some effect. What do I mean by that? Anytime your players channel mana into any kind of object, it should do something. It doesn't need to be something useful, but it should have some kind of effect. You don't want your players feeling like they're wasting things. You want to give them a reason to be using this mechanic, to be channeling their mana into various items along the way. This might seem intimidating to you as a narrator, but it's really not that hard. Let's say, Let's say they find a chess clock. They then decide to channel their mana into it. You as a game master look at this clock and think, what could that possibly do? Well, think about the attributes of a clock. It tells time. It has a circular motion. This particular one is blue and it measures the competition between two different players. So what could channeling mana into this do? It could have some kind of time effect. Perhaps when they channel the mana into it, it shows the moment that this clock was last used for. Or perhaps the circular motion of the hand creates an almost hypnotic effect, luring two people who are viewing it into a competition as it tries to engage in its purpose. Or perhaps the only thing that really matters about this is the color blue, and when you channel your mana into it, it dissolves into water and then streams out across the land. So you see, we have two possible effects that play into what its actual purpose purpose is, and then one that is just a little bit of a joke effect. So when you get to a time when your players are like, I channel energy into this random stick that I found, don't just say nothing happens. Give them something, some kind of effect, to encourage them to keep doing it. And now finally, from this video on narrator tips, we'll talk about the threat level. As it stands with the base game, when you assign a light threat level to a creature, it uses the entire stat block. The way that I would handle this instead would be to give certain creatures highs and lows on various stats on that block. So when you assign a creature a threat of medium, if it is a heavy combat creature, give it a high in combat, which means that you would take the stat from the next highest threat level. If it has a low in resistance because it's particularly susceptible to magic, then it would take the resistance from the next level down. You can use this to customize your creatures in a way that isn't just grabbing that single stat block. For a random encounter, that stat block is great. And honestly, even for a planned encounter, it's very good. But if you want just that little bit of extra unpredictability and uniqueness in combat, 
Use this to mix and match between the stat blocks and create a creature that's perfect for your situation. And that about wraps up this look into running the game of Rupture. Thanks for sticking around. I hope this has helped you feel a bit more confident in being able to dive into running your own game. And of course, much of what we've talked about here is easily transferable to other games, so don't feel like you need to use it specifically for Rupture. The tips talked about here could be used for whatever game you like. That said, I do highly recommend playing Rupture, but make sure you stay tuned because next time I will be giving my final review of this playtest version of the game. I'll be talking about what I like about the game, what I'm a little bit iffy about, and if there is anything that I don't like and would change. So make sure you subscribe and click that notification bell to know when that video goes live. And if you like the tone of this game, check out our actual plays here, or join the Rupture mailing list at www.rupturerpg.com. As always, a big thank you to our sponsor Rupture and our Patreon subscribers. You guys really help keep this channel going. Anyway, thank you again for watching, and remember, there's gaming outside the Forgotten Realms.